major companies that you probably heard about, Apple, Pinterest, Yahoo, and he's been very kind enough to come and share some of his insights about how design has been able to impact and shape companies as we go forward. And so thank you very much, Bob. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks for sharing your post-lunch uh, hour with me. It's always better to go after lunch than before lunch. It's pretty really testing before lunch. Um, your microphone. Is my microphone, I think it, is it not working? Okay, now it's working. Now it's working, I just have to talk louder. I can talk louder. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, or I want to share with you a, a presentation I first gave in Korea a few years back. And when I went to Korea, the you know common question is, how do we become more design driven? So it's something you hear a lot outside of Silicon Valley, it's something I hear a lot inside Silicon Valley. Um, I left Pinterest about four years ago, and I've spent the last few years kind of studying the history of Silicon Valley, trying to get high school students interested in coming into design, and then uh, advising and working with a bunch of different companies and networking. And it's given me a little bit of an opportunity to kind of take a higher level view of what really makes design work and why some companies are able to do really killer design, what, what the prerequisites are. And that's really what this talk is about, like how to take the founding vision of a company and push it all the way through to the final uh, deliverables, design deliverables that end consumers see. So I think we've got about an hour. Uh, uh, yes, yep. now I see that we have about 47 participants online, so wow. if they'll have any questions. Hi, uh, everybody online. <laughs> yeah. So There's not nearly that many here. <laughs> yeah, so uh, pause me in the uh, as I'm going along, if you have questions as we go along, but I think we'll probably have 15 or so yeah. minutes at the end. If the participants have any questions, uh, the, please post it on the channel and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll look them up. Okay. Cool. So we'll get started. Vision, mission, and culture. Lessons from Google, Amazon, and Apple, uh, with a special appearance by Disney at the end. So as I mentioned, you know, I get this question a lot from different companies, how can we be more design driven? Usually I turn that around to, well, uh, like, what do you actually mean by design, right? And some people think design is something like this, you know, which design is a, a problem solving methodology. And I talk about this some, that design's a, a way of approaching problems, it's a way of approaching what we might call wicked problems, which are complex, multivariate problems. We have to test out a bunch of solutions to try to balance all the variables. And in that way, design is sort of a peer to engineering or medicine or law. So design is a problem-solving methodology, and that's a lot of what the conversation around design thinking is talking about. Sometimes design's a style of work. It's super collaborative. Uh, people sit around looking at comps together, trying to figure out the best solution for users. Sometimes people think about design as standards, graphic design standards. There's been a lot of stuff lately about some of the manuals from uh, Massimo Vignelli and the stuff that he did with the New York City subway system. NASA has an amazing standards book that they put out around, I guess, kind of around the time of the Apollo program. So there's been a lot of attention lately to design systems. Sometimes people talk about design as complete products without really thinking about how those products come into come into being, they just see the final thing and they take it all in whole, like they just see the Mac and they think of the whole Mac and not all the constituent parts. Sometimes people think about design as a feeling or environment, it's very designery. You know, we talk about designer stores, that's probably mostly what we're talking about, it's sort of a, an emotional feeling. And sometimes we talk about design as sort of a set of principles, it's from uh, Mies van der Rohe, uh, design less is more. There's a couple of other definitions that I really like. Uh, this one from John Heskett, if you don't know his work, he's a design critic, he passed away a few years ago. Wrote a number of books, one that I read called uh, Toothpicks and Logos. It was pretty influential when I first started thinking about design. And this quote comes from that book. It says, design stripped to its essence can be defined as the human capacity to shape and make our environment in ways without precedent in nature to serve our needs and give meaning to our lives. So I think about design as sort of intentional living. It's almost more like a mindfulness practice to me. Um, you know, trying to determine what you want the future to be and then create things that are going to make that future possible. And then really my favorite, most simple quote comes from Edward Tufte, and you have some of his books over here on yourself. Tufte, I assume all you guys know Tufte's work. Um, you know, for him, design is clear thinking made visible. And to me, that's always the, the simplest definition of design. And it's really kind of sits at the heart of this presentation. So I want to cut from Tufty and, and talk a little bit about what makes uh, design when we get to products, like what makes that possible. So when I think about design, I think about icebergs. It's maybe kind of a weird analogy, but when we see icebergs, they look kind of pretty. They look kind of awesome. They look kind of aesthetically cool. But of course, we know this isn't really everything that's going on with the iceberg. Sort of a cliche metaphor, but of course, there's a lot going on underneath the iceberg. And that's really what I want to talk about more today. So I see design as one of many outcomes 
And those outcomes are created by people like yourself. And those people are attracted to the certain cultures. Uh, the culture itself is built from how things are organized, and organizations themselves arise from particular types of strategies. Strategies come from missions, and missions ultimately come from vision. And it's really that founding vision that has to drive things all the way through. And so when I talk to especially founders, I try to get them to think about this whole daisy chain of events. You know, a lot of times they want to just cut to the design. Can we just hire some superstar designer who's going to come in here and make everything awesome? I'm like, well, it doesn't really work that way. You kind of have to have all these things in place underneath them so that they can uh, do clear, so they can do work that's clearly reflective of the company. So let's go to the moon for a second. So I love talking about the Apollo program, and I'm happy to talk about that until like 5 o'clock this afternoon if anybody wants to stay around. Um, but when we think about going to the moon, we often think about this picture and only this picture. It's actually a picture of Buzz Aldrin on the moon shot about 50 years ago. Uh, it was sort of a, it's an interesting, funny moment because uh, Neil, actually Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, actually had the camera, and he said, hey, Buzz, look over here. Buzz just kind of turns around and they snap the picture, and it becomes one of the most famous pictures ever shot because um, they happen to be on the moon, so I guess location matters when you're a photographer. I also like to point out, this is the only photograph on the surface of the moon of Neil Armstrong, and that's him there in Buzz's uh, visor, because Neil was the only one with a camera. So all of you parents who aren't represented in your family photos, keep this in mind. You know, be sure that you occasionally get somebody else to take the camera and shoot a picture. But of course, Neil and Buzz were only two people that walked on the moon. There's a total of 12 that walked on the moon. 24 people traveled to the moon, three of them twice. And there's 400,000 people that worked in service of that mission. So we tend to think about the people at the very top, but there's a whole group of people underneath that. And I think that's where you can start to see the idea. These are all the different missions, of course. Apollo 11 July, landed on July 20th. Apollo 12, not too much longer after that. Apollo 13, we know about from the movie. Can you just need a switch off the microphone? Maybe you can just move it to the other side so that it's... Is it the speaker? You think it's signal because oh, I'm too far over? You think I'm just getting out of range with it? Is the, are there people online here? Yes. Uh, no, it's for the people here, the mic. Oh. How are, the, how are the people online? They're just hearing me from the Zoom thing? Yeah, but I think that now it's okay, right? Well, I just don't want to stand in front of the screen. No, 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 you can sit there. It's not you want to give me yours? Yeah. Do you think it's a battery thing? No, no, I think it was just the location of the mic. Now speak. No, no, no continue. Leave it there. It's okay now. Sure. Okay, speak for a second. One, two. Okay. Is it better? Yeah. Everything better? In and out. Is it? Yeah. We can just turn it off. Uh, I can just turn it off. Yeah. Okay. I can talk louder. Uh, I, was gonna turn it off. I think as long as it's picked up by Zoom, yeah. we don't need it, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I'll just turn it off back here. Okay. And then you guys can just look at me and I can talk even louder. Yeah. yeah. I have children. I can talk even louder. <laughs> much louder. I have college students. I can talk much louder. Um, so, of course, Paula landed on the moon six total times between 1969 and 1972. And you have to think about the pace at which they were doing that. Like putting people on the moon in those big giant Saturn V rockets is not trivial. So what's the environment, what's the, the organization that created that? And of course it starts with vision. We talk a lot about President Kennedy's speech at uh, Rice University, but vision is really this fundamental question of where are we going? And, it, and it's, an, it's an unobtainable goal. Jeff Weiner, who's the CEO of LinkedIn, he talks about it's the company's North Star. If you ever have a vision statement that you think is obtainable, you have the wrong vision statement. It should be something that's constantly aspirational, always over the next hill, something to pull you to. The, the mission, which is the next layer down, is something that you think you could actually accomplish. So in Kennedy's speech, he actually talks a lot more about the mission of going to the moon than the vision of space exploration. And his mission was really straightforward. Send a man to the moon, return him safely to the Earth before the end of the decade. That's actually a pretty achievable goal. It turns out to be, actually, it was achievable. So you have to uh, put somebody there, you have to get him home safely, which is kind of a critical part and you have to do so in the next eight years. It's a very clear mission. And then the strategy, this is a great story. This is actually John Hubolt, who was the guy at NASA uh, that was involved in the mission that was the one that most advocated for what's called lunar orbit rendezvous. So that's how you have two spacecraft that fly to the moon and one of them lands and one of them stays in orbit around the moon. So that whole idea was not actually around when Kennedy first proposed going to the moon. It was actually about two years of debate after his initial uh, call at, at, uh, in 1961 before they figured that out. So strategies like how are we going to go about it? How are we actually going to get to the moon? An organization, how are we going to structure the work? Now, this is mission control and we take that for granted that that structure just exists but there was a guy named Chris Kraft who invented the whole concept of mission control. 
and, and that that's how the, the people in Houston were actually going to support the mission. And I can assure you that the mission had a better chance of landing with just the machines than that the men had the men in the uh, spacecraft had chance of landing without mission control. Like the, the mission was successful because of mission control, because of that system and how they created decisions, how they made decisions. And then this is a picture of that same room, but obviously it's a huge difference between the structure when you actually put people in there. So the kind of culture you create around mission control and the kind of people it attracted was central to how the organization succeeded. And of course it did, did succeed multiple times. We think about this as a success point. Of course the actual success point is this, splash down when they get them safely back to the Earth. So let's cut from the moon to Menlo Park. So just up the street from here, this is a house that's owned by uh, Susan Muchozik, who's currently the CEO of uh, YouTube. This is actually the garage where um, Larry Page and Surya Brand created Google. So they worked out of uh, Susan's garage for a, a little while. And so this is actually the house in Menlo Park, again, just a couple of miles from here, where an almost trillion dollar company was started. Um, so this is Sergey early on. And his founding vision for the company, sort of the, the itch they were trying to scratch, was that they believed they could create a better search engine. And a simple idea that, all, that not all pages were created equal, some were more important. Um, a little Silicon Valley trivia. Of course, PageRank, which we all think of as a way of ranking pages, is actually named after Larry Page. Um, so just sort of lucky last name there. Um, so these are the two founders, and they were really young. And their vision is, as we all kind of know, to organize all the world's information. Again, a, a great aspirational vision. You're never going to organize all the world's information. But you can see how you start adding products around that and how you continue to grow the company with that kind of a vision. And then the mission is to build the perfect search engine that is one that understands exactly what you mean and gives you back exactly what you want. That's actually pretty close to obtainable. You know, it's not quite as aspirational and as far flung as the vision, uh, but it's a nice extension from the vision. And if you think about the culture they've created, if you look at their cultural values, focus on the user and all else follows. This is actually taken from their website. It's best to do one thing really, really well. I'm not convinced how much they really believe that, but they've got it up there. Fast is better than slow. Democracy on the web works. I'm not totally convinced of that one, but they believe it. You don't need to be at your desk to need an answer. You can make money without doing evil. I'll leave that one alone. Uh, there's always more information out there. Information crosses all borders, except a few. Uh, you can be serious without a suit, and great just isn't good enough. I mean, this is a culture that's going to attract a certain type of person, right? It's going to attract, well, actually, it's going to attract a lot of engineers. That's what it's going to attract. Uh, and you can see how that would flow from their vision and mission. If you're trying to organize all the world's information, you probably need people that are attracted to these sorts of cultural values. And then if you think about how they hire, again, from their job site, you get something like this. There's no one kind of Googler, so they're trying to hire a really diverse workforce. Always looking for people who can bring new perspectives and life experiences to our teams. They're looking for a place that values curiosity, passion, and desire to learn. Seeking challenges, uh, big thinkers, take on fresh challenges as a team, then you're a future Googler, right? This is an environment that's gonna really value collaboration. It's gonna value people who have like big aspirations, who wanna be around a diverse group of folks. This is, this is gonna attract a very specific type of person, and they're gonna look like all the people that work at Google now which again flows in, in perfect harmony with the, uh, the vision and mission of the company. I like to kind of look at the logos of these companies too because I think it reflects how they evolved um, and how they got to the clarity of what they have now. So for a year, 1997 and 1998, which is not really that long ago, um, that was the logo that they had, <laughs> just sort of skunky. Um, shockingly created by Sergey Brent using GIMP? Nobody know what GIMP? Does anybody know what GIMP? Okay, some of you know what GIMP is. I have no idea. Uh, then they went. Then they went to this. Like a couple of years later, they go to this. Uh, it was a little bit better. You notice they've got the colors kind of right from the beginning, um, and the colors apparently were trying to. They were trying to derive like primary colors from kids' play sets, so they were trying to get this playful element into it pretty early on. And then they went to this, and this is a logo we all knew for a long time. This was around for what 16 years. Um, and here it looks like somebody with a little bit of typographic knowledge may have actually gotten involved. They've rotated the O's a little bit. There's something kind of cute going on with the E. I'm still not quite sure the drop shadow and the serifs seem a little harsh, but okay. They had that around for a long time. And then just recently, about four years ago, they really cleaned things up. They got a professional designer involved. And you end up with this. Notice how they've retained a lot of the original colors, which is still kind of this playful, ch uh, children's-like exploration type thing, but not exactly the primary colors. And then still kind of a little nice move with the E. The tilted E makes it a little bit more fun. 
So one of the things I talked about at the beginning was the importance of strategy. Um, when you think about Google, Amazon, and Apple, they tend to get bucketed together, but if you really look at their business model and how they're trying to compete, like what the strategy of their business is, they're competing in really different domains. So I have this theory that companies kind of evolve from competing on capabilities to then competing, and once capabilities uh, get commodified, then they move up and they start, they start competing on business value, and then once everything kind of ends up costing the same, then they move and they start finally competing on product design. And that's sort of the, uh, the evolution of these three companies that I'll show you. So Google, what they compete on, the reason you go to Google is because they have incredible capabilities. Nobody's going there because they're beautiful. Nobody's going there because it's a great deal. It's, it's free. You can't really think of it as a great deal because it's free. But they have amazing capabilities. The stuff you can do with Google Docs, the things you can do with the search engine are phenomenal uh, functional capabilities. So keep that in mind. And if we go from Google, we kind of think, well, once all that stuff gets commodified, what's the next thing you compete on? You probably start com competing on business value, right? So this is, I'm gonna offer the customer a deal, right? So every, uh, like the capabilities have all gotten equal. So now we're gonna start talking about pricing, and coupons, and deals, right? And a company that does that really well was started in this house, in this garage in Seattle, and that of course is Mr. Bezos. And Jeff said pretty early on, there's two kinds of companies, those that work to try to charge more, and those that work to try to charge less, we will be the second. Clearly, Jeff is trying to compete on business value. He's trying to offer people a deal. Uh, and value isn't necessarily the cheapest thing, it's this overall concept of things are worth it to me, and I feel like I'm getting a good deal, and I know the, 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 uh, the retailer, and I have a good reputation there. It's gonna be, it would be hard for him to compete otherwise, because if he's was just competing on cap technical capabilities, then you're fighting against every other online bookstore. You have to have some way of kind of moving beyond that, and so they went to business value. This is Jeff when he was a little bit less confident of himself. Um, and this is actually the first book that they sold on Amazon. Uh, Fluid Concepts and Creative Analogies, Computer Models of the Fundamental Mechanisms of Thought, is what it says. So pretty geeked out there early on on Amazon. But if you look at their, their vision and their mission, their vision is to be the Earth's most customer-centric company. Again, completely unobtainable, but like a really great direction for a company. Like if, if, that, if you came to work every day thinking, oh, we're supposed to be the most customer-centric company on earth, you would kind of know what to do. And then, uh, you guys can't quite see it, but here, to build a place where people can come to find and discover anything they might want to buy online. That's, I mean, that's a mission that's actually kind of obtainable. You know, anything's maybe a little bit of a stretch, but you could imagine people coming to work thinking, oh, that's, the, that's actually the tactical thing I'm trying to do today. And then if we look at uh, Amazon's culture, you know, the cultural values, customer obsession, ownership, invest and simplify, or write a lot, learn and be curious, hire and develop the best, insist on the highest standards, think big, bias for action, frugality, earn trust, dive deep, backbone, disagree and commit, and then deliver results. This is definitely not Google, right? This is not necessarily a culture that I think is going to be really attractive to engineers. Uh, there's not a ton of stuff in here about collaboration. There's not a ton of stuff in here about invention. This looks to me like a culture that's going to attract business people. Um, and people who want to spend a lot of time in spreadsheets trying to optimize supply chains and warehouse distributions and things like that. Especially this kind of stuff, invest and simplify. You can't imagine you know, that, that sitting over at Google or Apple. Like, people that want to invest and simplify probably aren't going to those other companies. So their, their culture is attracting people that are going to work in service of their mission and value. Mission and vision, sorry. And then it was really hard to actually find an uplifting picture of people getting hired at Amazon. Um, so this is about as good as I could do. Um, you'd be surprised what you find when you're looking for pictures of people working at Amazon. Uh, but if you look at how they hire, at least this is how they describe it, we're a company of pioneers, which of course that's an interesting play because they're based in Seattle, they're pretty close to Pioneer Square, so they, they get kind of a Seattle thing off the Pioneer word. Uh, it's our job to make bold bets and they get energy from inventing on behalf of customers. Again, that's not really what you hear in Google. They, don't, they say they're customer first, but they don't talk about it as strongly as Amazon does. Success is measured against the possible, not the probable. That's not Larry and Sergey. They want to build like, this magical search engine. They very much believe in the impossible. And then for days, today's pioneers, that's exactly why there's no place on earth they'd rather build an Amazon. Notice how Amazon keeps coming back to this global thing as well. Like, they have really big ambitions um, about you know, being the best company, the most customer-centric company on earth. If you look at their logo, uh, shockingly, this was their logo for five years, um, and it's really horrible. Um, 
uh, Earth's biggest books bookstore, which is probably true, and it was probably only 5% of what it is now, but I'm sure in 1994 it was indeed the Earth's biggest bookstore. bookstore. Um, then I guess they had an epiphany after five years and realized that wasn't great, and so they switched to this. Some of you might remember. Um, couldn't get a good copy of it, but I love this books, music, and more, because the stress really becomes around that word more. And they only held this logo for a couple of years because they were starting to outgrow the book thing, and they just started exploding from there. And so they needed something to do, something beyond the word of more. And that's when you pick up the modern Amazon logo that we see all the time. And this logo, I, this is one of my favorite logos. I'm actually not a huge fan, not at all a fan of Amazon's design. I'm not necessarily a great fan of the company, but and this logo is phenomenal because it does indeed go from A to Z, um, so which kind of implies they sell everything. And there's this great little smile implied there which really, I think, echoes their customer-centric thing. So it's like from A to Z with a smile. It's sort of a, they're communicating a lot in that mark. Um, they flows right back up to the founding vision of what, what Jeff imagined when he started the company in 94. So we've talked about Google competing as a capability, Amazon competing as a business value. So the next thing is when you really start talking about design-driven companies. And when you go and you interact with the, as a customer, when you go interact with a design-driven company, you're really buying the product, right? And that company has to be delivering on the, the capability that they're, whatever it is they're buying has to be able to do the thing. And then you've got to perceive it as a great value. You don't have to perceive it as cheap, but you've got to perceive it as value for your money. And then you have to kind of fall in love with the product. Um, and of course, the poster child for that was also started in a garage. This one in the other direction, down south in Los Altos. Um, this is the house that Steve grew up in, uh, which is remarkably only about two miles from where the main campus is today, proving that Steve didn't really get very far from home. <laughs> um, here he is. Uh, we started out to get a computer in the hands of everyday people, and we succeeded beyond our wildest dreams. That emphasis on computer in the hands of everyday people, we take that for granted today, but in 1976, if you study the history of computing, that is radical, radical revolutionary stuff. Because up till then, computers were all about supporting the military and the government and big giant, uh, bureauc uh, big giant uh, corporations. And it's hard to imagine in the early 60s, grad students and, and undergrads over at Berkeley were actually protesting with punch cards around their neck against the power of computing. Like they freaking hated computers as early as 1960. And within you know, really 15 years, you've got the personal computer revolution and a few very successful hippies starting these companies to try to get computers into the hands of everyday people. So it really, again, we take it for granted, but it's a revolutionary idea. This is uh, Steve and Steve when they uh, didn't look so great. Uh, it's over the board of an Apple One computer before, I guess before they got into the wooden box. Now, Apple doesn't talk about their founding vision and mission in the same way. It's a little bit hard to find really, or really precise statements of it. I worked there for eight years. Um, you fall into it really quickly. Um, and it just becomes part of the water that you drink. It's just part of the environment. So they don't really have to talk about it in the same way. Um, this is somewhat my interpretation of that, but if I, I know this comes from their website. From the, They use this a lot in their press releases. Um, and this is sort of my interpretation. I felt that the vision of Apple was that technology could have a transformative effect on the lives of individuals. So I kind of go back to that idea, transformative effect on the lives of individuals. Really different from what Amazon and Google are trying to do, right? The transformative piece is really powerful. So it plays into that whole bicycle for your mind thing, um, and it's why they've been always been so focused on consumers and over um, enterprise customers. Hundred thousand employees dedicating to, make, to making the best products on the earth and leaving the world better than we found it. Um, that's kind of an achievable mission. You could actually probably exit the earth thinking you've made it a better place. So I can see you doing that. And I can see you waking up in the morning thinking you're actually making the best products on Earth. Uh, I can definitely see this as an achievable thing in service of that higher order vision. This is the new giant spaceship that somehow landed in Cupertino. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have gone to see it. There's a pretty cool visitor center across the street. It, it is sort of a, it's an architectural wonder that's uh, in a really bizarre place because um, there's like these 1950s track homes just across the street from it. Um, if you go visit it, just ask yourself this question, where in the world did they get all those trees from? because um, there's like all these mature trees around the place. This picture, yeah, if you look at all these trees, like none of those trees were there two years ago, right? They like, they sucked up every grown tree in a nursery in the whole Bay Area to populate this thing. 
And so they don't have like a really explicit uh, cultural statement like the other two companies do, but this is taken from an interview that Tim Cook did with Fortune magazine. I'm not going to read you the whole thing, but I've highlighted a couple of phrases here. Some great products, focusing on innovating, own and control primary technologies, focus on the few, deep collaboration and cross-pollination, don't settle for anything less than excellence. Um, I mean, those, again, are going to attract a certain type of person. Um, not everybody, you know, lots of people are going to settle for things less than excellence. Probably not anybody in this room, but trust me, there's a lot of people in the world that will settle for something less than excellence. And focus on the few is definitely not Google's strategy, and it's not Amazon's strategy either. Like, Apple's going to do three or four things really well. Those other companies are going to try a gazillion different experiments and see what survives. And if you look at how they hire, it's what we do together that sets us apart. Perfectionist, idealist, inventors, forever tinkering with products and processes, always on the lookout for better. Uh, whether you're one of our global offices or um, your job at Apple will be demanding, but it also rewards bright, original thinking and hard work. None of us would have it any other way. I mean, these are, again, pretty different from what I think we saw at Google and Amazon. I'm, I'm not sure perfectionist is going to do great at Google. Um, and I'm not sure an idealist is going to do great at, at Amazon. Right? Amazon's focused on doing the possible, not the, or the probable, not the impossible or something. That's not a great environment for, ide for idealists and perfectionists. Uh, but Apple attracts those kinds of people, and that's what they are trying to accomplish. And if we look at their logo, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's kind of a crazy mark. Uh, drawn, you can't see it here, but it was uh, drawn in 1976, and it's got this like, Newton quote around the edge. I'm not quite sure how they thought this was going to get on a t-shirt, but I'm not sure Steve and Steve were worried about it at the time. Already by 1977, they had moved to uh, this mark, which a lot of you are probably familiar with. The colors are actually kind of interesting. They went to the colors really early on because the Apple II could plug into a color television set and generate colors, and no other PC could do that at the time. So it was really a, a way for the logo to demonstrate their unique capabilities. Uh, it was also sort of this kid's playful thing. It's come to mean a lot more um, in the... 50 years since, 40 years since, uh, but originally it was sort of a reference back to a capability of their, their computer. And then of course they simplify that mark even more as they find out more who they are and as they simplify their products and they get down to just the silhouette, uh, which they've only recently begun manipulating a lot more, but for a long time, like when Steve was alive, you did not screw with the logo, ever. And just to kind of go back to this idea of how companies evolve and that they have to go through each one of these stages, this is an ad early on from 1976. It's for the Apple One here on Welch Road in Palo Alto. So this is all about the computer's capabilities. This is nothing but speeds and feeds with this rather frightening price of $666.66. Um, so you can see this is where they started with, right? They're competing on capabilities. And then in the middle of the Mac era, what we might call the Scully years, it really kind of becomes more about business value. And you see them talking about deals and you know, tryouts and uh, that you could go for test drives, all that kind of stuff. It becomes about bundles and things like that. And then when Steve comes back, he, comp he pivots the company because he realized in 1996 that he, if he went head to head with Dell, it was all going to be about price and supply chain optimization. And he wanted to be able to take value to the next higher level because otherwise it was just going to be a race to the bottom. And so when he came back to Apple, he made the whole company compete on design as the value that, that the company was adding. I mean, what I don't necessarily think that that you would have done that in the absence of everything else being commodified, but that was like the that was the competitive landscape that was available. And at this point, you see a lot of the ads. This is a uh, from a while back. But you see a lot of the ads being focused just on the product. So three logos, three really different companies. Um, a lot of meaning, I think, in all three of these marks. So I think really clear design expressions, not necessarily product design expressions, but really clear design deliverables and expressions of what these companies mean, all the way back up through that daisy chain up to the founding vision. So I want to take this one level further and show you guys a couple of ads. Um, so you're probably going to cry at all three. You're definitely going to cry at the last one. Uh, so I'm probably going to look away, because I always get weepy. Uh, but I'm going to show you one great Google ad, one great Amazon ad, and one great Apple ad. And think again about uh, how I'm describing what they compete on and how these ads are designed deliverable against those values. I hope you guys can hear this.
pretty good ad. <laughs> it's it's uh, all about functionality. There's not a human face anywhere in there. It is all about the search engine and about the magic of that search engine. Find anything you want, find the results instantly. It's very uh, much in keeping with what their vision and mission's about. This next one's from a Japanese ad from Amazon. <laughs> okay, talk about a customer-centric company. I mean, these guys sell everything. They got freaking dog costumes, man. <laughs> and they can deliver them to you later that day. Like, that is just a great expression of, of their capability and their, and their value. And then this last one from, uh, from Apple, which is really a tearjerker. I hope you actually can't hear it too well. But. Usually I get a couple of tears now. Um, so again, if you think about Apple's vision, there's uh, the product is actually kind of a, a side character. And obviously the teenager has a phone, but the phone's certainly not front and center like the search engine was in the Google app. And he talks about the transformative effect of the technology on that family's experience. Like that's just, again, a very different expression than what you would have seen from the other two companies. It's very consistent with Apple's founding vision. So, as I mentioned, we go from competing on capabilities to competing on business value to competing on uh, product. You know, might ask yourself, well, if I'm a customer, is there something I'm going to pay for after the product? And I've been able to think of one thing that comes after this. So if you're not buying the capability and it's not really about the value and you're not really just necessarily buying the product, what's the other thing that you might be drawn to? We might call it true experience-driven companies because what you're buying when you interact with a true experience-driven company is you're buying a memory. Um, it's actually not even necessarily the experience itself as it happens, it's the memory of the experience that I think you end up paying for. And the best example I have of that, also started in a garage. Um, this one in Southern California in 1920. The specific idea started on this bench. Um, this bench used to be at Griffith Park in Los Angeles uh, around the merry-go-round. And there was a particular Sunday afternoon when a gentleman named Walt Disney, who you might have heard of, uh, was sitting on this bench and he was watching his daughters play. And he noticed that uh, all the families, the kids were playing and the adults were just sitting by themselves. So he had this idea for a place where families could go and have an experience together. And it took him quite a few years actually before that initial insight and idea got turned into Disneyland. Um, but eventually it did. Um, he got some funding. They actually went from breaking ground on Disneyland to opening the park within 12 months, which is just a phenomenal construction project. It's of course not the Disneyland we know today, but a lot of the, the key parts are there. Uh, as I like to say, the main information architecture of Disneyland was set right from the very beginning. The five main lands of Tomorrowland, Adventureland, Frontierland, uh, and Fantasyland was all there right from the very beginning. 
You know, he said, I think what I want Disneyland most of all is a happy place, a place where adults and children can experience together some of the wonders of life and adventure and feel better because of it. Right? This is actually kind of, a, again, a memory-based vision of what the place should be. And of course, Disneyland's vision is my favorite vision statement of all time, the happiest place on earth. It's super simple, um, it's unobtainable, it's incredibly aspirational, and if you're there and you walk around Disneyland, the occasional fight on YouTube uh, accepted, you can see that that's really what's driving all those employees and what's driving all those design decisions. You know, I'm always mar I always marvel when I'm there that there's no trash on the ground, but then I realize that's because there's a trash can every 12 feet or something like that, right? There's trash cans everywhere because the happiest place on earth can't have a lot of trash around. <laughs> So giving, this is their, uh, their, their uh, mission statement, giving millions of guests each year the chance to spend time with their families and friends, making memories that last a lifetime. You know, if you look at their hiring uh, thing, I'm sorry, I couldn't find anything specifically about culture, but again, a cast that makes memories. No place in the world quite like the Disneyland Resort. In fact, yeah, it's the happiest place on earth. There can't be any place quite like it. Provide experiences that will be remembered forever, um, and you can create memories for our guests. So. Again, like what's that thing you compete on after you're competing on the product? You compete on a true experience of memory. So go back to the initial question, how can we be more design driven? I'll kind of remind you of the iceberg, this whole value chain, a vision, vision drives mission, mission determines strategy, strategy dictates organization, organization builds a culture, culture attracts a certain type of people, certain types of people generate income outcomes. And I see design is an outcome. Or in the words of Edward Tufte, design is clear thinking made visible.